everybody, Razorblade Mango here, and it's time to talk about some reveals, new trailers, and everything in between. So I'm specifically going to limit it to uh, four games for this video. I'm going to talk about Destiny, Rise of Iron, Injustice 2, Watch Dogs 2, and Kingdom Hearts 2.8. Uh, I'm going to start, I'm going to go in that order. So... First things first, uh, I'm going to talk about Destiny Rise of Iron. Now, my I, I admittedly have a very love-hate relationship with Destiny. There are days when I can't, I cannot stand its guts, and I just go, "Ah, oh, fuck you, Destiny, you suck." But and then there are other days where I I see something from Destiny, and I go, "Wow." this series is cool, or I hear the music, I have the soundtrack, and the soundtrack is still the best thing about the original game, hands down, no debate, no discussion. So, as expected, and as was previously leaked a few few months back, we're going to be getting the next expansion in September, which is called Destiny Rise of Iron, and this is focused on Lord Saladin, who is the guy that runs the the Iron Banner whenever that event pops up for the PvP. I don't bother a lot with the PvP for Destiny anymore, so... The Iron Banner events have never really interested me, but for people that are fans of it, I, I, I can understand how this would be very exciting for them. So I'm reading from the Destiny website, and for each game that I'll talk about, I'll have the link in the description box where I'm going to be reading my information from. So, according to Bungie, here's what Rise of Iron is going to be about. Rise of Iron features an epic, cinematic story campaign set within the Plaguelands, a brand new location on Earth. Under the command of Lord Saladin, you will face a new faction of fallen devils, the Splicers, while unraveling the mystery of the Iron Lords. So, that's the campaign. Uh, and from what I've heard, it's going to be... It's going to be sold at $30, uh, so they're right on the money with people predicting that this was going to be a midway point between you know the big expansion stuff that we got with Taken King and then the little microscopic stuff that we got with um, House of Wolves. So this is right in the middle, and the price point shows that. Now whether it's worth $30 or not, I don't know. Uh, particularly compared to something like the um, um, Witcher 3 Blood and Wine, which is $20 and packs more content than most $60 games out there, as with you know anything by CD Projekt Red, because I love them, and they're awesome. So, what comes with Rise of Iron? Well, you're going to get the campaign, you're going to get some new quests, you're going to get new armor, new gear, um, if you pre-order, which... Please don't pre-order. Uh, you're going to get the Galahorn, which is an old Gear 1 weapon. And it's going to be a black and silver iron Galahorn rocket launcher. And it's only available if you pre-order. Because of course it is. So, get that. New weapons. Uh, new raid, which I think is the most interesting thing out of the whole thing. Because I do really like... I like the design of the raids, even though I'm not a fan of I'm not a big fan of Destiny. I, I my experience with it is very off and on, um, and even I, I recent my most recent experience with it was going back to to it after playing Doom extensively, and Doom is just so fast and so fluid and looks beautiful at at 60 frames per second on my PS4. To then go back to Destiny and have it be 30 frames per second, and it feels very sluggish, it feels very slow and weighty, and I don't like it. I, I don't care for the PvP anymore. I'm spoiled. I've been spoiled by other games for the past two years, ever since Destiny came out, so the PvP doesn't do it for me anymore. What would get me into Rise of Iron is if I see something that that is like, hey, for all you PvE people out there, here's something that you need to buy this in order to play. And I'm definitely not going to buy this day one. There's no way. Uh, not when I have Final Fantasy XV coming out a little over a week 
after this. So no, I'm I my answer right now is no. Um, but let me keep on reading what it has. Uh, new raid, which is probably going to be cool. Maximum light increase, which is of course it is. It's always funny how people go, I must grind, I must grind, get to the top, the top, the top levels, and it's and all I can think is. What's the point? Because next year they're just going to release another update and have that. Not even next year with this year, because they had that April update which increased the light level. So, it, it seems to me just a waste of time to grind for those last few levels to get the gear you need. New strike, which is cool. I, I liked the strikes from the Taken King. I didn't like the strike from the, the April update. I thought it was very short and weak and not particularly very interesting new plague land zone and social space which is cool uh new crucible map maps and mode don't really care about that new enemy faction and bosses which mm, they're they're just fallen but with the new skin to them basically so rise of iron it's destiny at this point. At this point, this is why I started with this first, because this is the one I find the least interesting out of all the, the announcements that's happened over the past the past two days. I just and it's not it's not the level of indifference of something like, say, Call of Duty. But when I see Destiny now, I go, you know, I'll check it out, I'll see what's in it, and I'll wait. Because I'm pretty sure this is going to go on sale a few months after it comes out. I'll pick it up then because, you know, what the hell. I, it'll be cheaper and why not? Whatever. I will not have paid $30 for it. And I certainly will not have pre-ordered it. So I don't I don't care about some black and... I don't care about a, a, a black and silver iron gal horn. I don't give a shit. Especially when I'm probably not going to fucking use it. So... That is Destiny Rise of Iron. Really don't care. <laughs> well, actually no. I kinda sorta. I'd like to care, but meh at this point. Just meh. Alright, next thing to talk about is Injustice 2, which, come on, who did not see this coming? This has been talked about. I mentioned this in my own E3 video that I, I predicted that this was going to be announced during Sony's conference. And now that it's been announced with a cinematic trailer, bet you anything we're going to get some gameplay, or a trailer during the Sony conference. So I'm reading from PlayStation Blog, and it's basically just the usual spiel about, you know, blah blah blah, we're going to have new characters, new, new areas, we're going to have better environment destruction and stuff like that, which... I must say, in it, when compared to Injustice and Mortal Kombat X, I liked Injustice a lot more. I I really really liked Injustice. I thought that game was a lot of fun. I enjoy playing that with friends. I I recently I might I might re-download it so I can play it again with people. But it's a fun game. Uh, it had some balancing issues. The online wasn't all that great, but it's. It's a fun game. I really like it. I liked it a lot more than Mortal Kombat X. Now, here's where my concern comes in for Injustice 2. They're introducing this new gear system, which according to them, and this, this is from PlayStation Blog, it says, The gear system uses RPG-like mechanics to reward you with loot drops every time you play the game. With each loot drop, you will earn character-specific gear to outfit and power up your roster, changing not only the look of each character, but your fight strategy and your personal approach to, each, to every match. So, this, I, this to me is a very worrying sign that this game is going to have microtransactions in it. It's going to be like Mortal Kombat X, where it has microtransactions, and they're going to do the exact same thing, where they're going to slow down. This is what this is what killed my enjoyment of Mortal Kombat X. The progression system is so slow, and I know, I know for a fact that they gimped it when the game launched because I knew I personally knew people who got the game before the release date. And played it, 
and the uh, the amount of coins you would earn was so much quicker and then they released a patch and it swiftly cut it down by a lot so the process to get coins to unlock new stuff to unlock new skins became a grind and it w it j coupled with the the easy fatality microtransactions and that bullshit unlock everything mic $20 microtransaction I'd had enough. I was just, and it, it made me regret buying the game. And I had that game. I was, it was one of my most anticipated games of 2015. And it probably would have been a great game if Warner Brothers had not stepped in and told NetherRealm, you need to do this. So I don't trust Warner Brothers, and I don't trust NetherRealm under Warner Brothers' direction. So, this has me concerned, and especially with this loot drop stuff, this whole system, they talk about how, oh, we need to introduce something new, this gear system to me just seems like an excuse to cram as many microtransactions in as possible. And what worries me as well is that they're talking about how this these items will increase your, your strength, will talk about how, oh, it will buff your health. So if, if there are microtransactions in it, and if these, these, these gear items do make you more powerful, do make you have an advantage in battle, this game will be pay to win. And that to me, it, it will cross that line. I know, I know, I don't like games that have microtransactions in it, even when they're cosmetic. I, I stand by that. I don't like microtransactions in full retail games, full price retail games. I don't like it in Plants vs. Zombies Garden Warfare 2. I don't like it in Uncharted 4. I don't like it in Mortal Kombat X. I don't like it in even even um um something like something as good as Metal Gear Solid 5, which it is so good. I don't like the microtransactions in there. And fuck Konami. So this could end up being a pay-to-win situation. And that's bad that's very very bad that's a bad sign for this series so i i don't i i don't like this gear system i'm already seeing the the red flag warning signs from this so i'm definitely going to keep my eye on this and then i'm sure when the game when i see gameplay from it it's going to look great i'm going i'm going to be like wow that looks cool but then my cynicism towards Warner Brothers is going to kick in, and I'm just going to go, eh. So, for now, this is a lot like um, what I said about the original Injustice. You know, before my, my bad experience with Mortal Kombat X, where I, I'm saying, I'm, I'm holding off. I'm going to wait. And I'd recommend you guys do it as well. I would wait until they came out with some Injustice... A two ultimate edition, a, a, a um, big, big edition, where they have all the characters in, all the, the stuff, so I would wait for that, and I'd wait for that to go on sale, because I'm not liking, as far as this gear system, I don't trust them, and I think, I think, um, even Mortal Kombat X, I was disappointed with the roster, but... DC characters, the ones that they've announced so far are pretty cool. Like, you've got Supergirl is in there. You've got Gorilla Grodd, they talked about. you got got um, Atricidus from the, the Red Lantern Corps is going to be in there, who's pretty cool. you got, of course, Batman, Superman, Flash, Aquaman, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, probably. So, I'm actually more excited for the roster than I am for the actual game, to be honest. So, I hope I hope they don't have microtransactions. But knowing Warner Brothers, I'm not holding my breath. So, yeah, that uh, keeping an eye on that. Okay, moving on to Watch Dogs 2. A lot of info came out for that. Um, so basically, it's going to come out in on November 15, 2016. It's going to be set in San Francisco. And it, it is a sequel to the... It's not a dumb prequel. It's a sequel to the first Watch Dogs. It's going to be in San Francisco and the surrounding Bay Area. It's going to have a new protagonist named Marcus Holloway, 
who is a part of the DeadSec Corporation, not Corporation, but the DeadSec Hacker Group, who were a presence in the first game. A, a dumb presence, but a presence nonetheless. Um, he's being accused of a crime he didn't commit by the, uh, the, um, the city monitoring system. So he has to go out and, and, um, prove his innocence. He's got to help people in the city. He's got to help his dead sec team. He's got to help other hackers. So they're making this like, this is a team thing rather than, you know, I am Aiden Pierce and I must go out and do everything because I'm Batman. So, and they, they, they talk a good line about how, oh, yes, um, uh, Marcus is, is a much more expressive and interesting character than Aiden Pierce. He's just such a fun guy. He is so funny. He's likable. So, he's basically everything Aiden Pierce wasn't. <laughs> but... They, and, and Ubisoft has talked a good li bunch of lip service before, so we'll see if this actually, if he's actually this funny, likable character that they're making him out to be. And they're making him more, um, like more maneuverable. You can you can actually punch in this game, which I don't know why that wasn't a feature in the first one. You can actually punch people, there's melee combat, there's parkour, so you can actually jump on top of shit this time, which was one of my biggest problems with the first Watch Dogs, because the fact that he couldn't run and jump on shit and fight, even like punch people, made it feel so stiff and lifeless and boring, and I, I, I appreciate that. He's going to have this like weird... Um, pool ball melee weapon that they showed off in the trailer it looked it looked kind of cool the way he, they were like hitting people with it he uh, he has also got a remote controlled car he's got a scout drone so they're bringing some kind of like division influence into it and speaking of division they have a new cooperative mode where i don't know if this is going to be like a huge part of the game but, I don't, and I don't know if you can turn this off, because I turned off the multiplayer elements for the original Watch Dogs, and I didn't really want to bother, because they would erase your progress if you'd want to turn them off again, which I hated. I hated that that was a thing in Watch Dogs. It, it turned me off of the multiplayer completely. So, they're bringing a little bit of Division influence into this, and me being so passive about... The division. I don't know how that's going to pan out, but you know, time only time will tell. Um, so yeah, it's basically they're saying pretty much everything about this that they are, you know, about every other open world game that they make. They're like, oh, it's going to be dynamic. It's going to be cinematic. It's going to have iconic stuff in it. <laughs> so it's going to have this bustling city, and when you walk through it it's going to feel like you're alive and stuff like it, the, 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 the game world is alive. And I must say, and I don't want to, I don't want to jump the gun too quickly. I'm, I'm definitely still very skeptical about it. Even with all the, because it was funny when I first read the, the PlayStation blog post where it was like five things you must know about watchdogs. It was, it seemed like every point they made, <laughs> was was trying to convince me that hey this is the exact opposite of what the first Watch Dogs is. You don't like Aiden Pierce? Well, we have this guy, Marcus Holloway, who is actually funny and agile and cool and he's he's not afraid to crack a joke and stuff like that. And then you have like, "Oh, you didn't like Chicago and how how dead and sterile and plasticky it felt?" Well, here, here's California, here's San Francisco. It's going to be alive and bustling, and it will have that, that California flavor to it. Oh, you didn't like the the shitty the shitty driving? Well, here, here, we're going to have driving. We're going to make that so much better and have e cars have weight to them and everything. So, you know, that, and all that sounds good in theory. That all sounds good. The, the footage I've seen from the game, I will admit, I actually do like what I see, divorcing my feelings about this series in general from that video, that video did look fun. It looked like an enjoyable game, but I'm still going to be very skeptical about it. Uh, I 
I, I need to know before I, I I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fucking be like, oh, this game's gonna be so good until I actually have a controller in my hand and play it. And I most likely will play it eventually. Because that was the problem with the first Watch Dogs. And, and good on, and I will admit, good on Ubisoft for keeping their mouth shut about it and not showing any footage of it until, until like a few months before it comes out. That's good. They need to keep that up. I know they've done that with Assassin's Creed in the past, but they, this needs to be the thing with their games from now on. Because now that they've shown what the game is actually going to look like, rather than some spruced up E3 demo of it, that does nothing, doesn't look like it at all when it comes out, good. Keep it that way. I like that. Probably not going to happen when I see Wildlands and For Honor next time, but it's I, I, probably going to not happen with Watch Dogs, which thankfully, it's good. So, that being said, um, am I interested in Watch Dogs 2? And I must say, yeah, I, it has my interest. Uh, you have my, <laughs> it's, it's like the, the Django and Chain thing. You had my curiosity, but now you have my attention, which is exactly what Watch Dogs 2 has. You have my attention. Please show me something that makes me want to get back into this series. And I, I don't want to go back and play the first one. Because I, it was a piece of shit, and I hate it, and it's one of the my most least liked games ever. So, I just hope Watch Dogs 2 mends the wounds that the first one inflicted upon me. Alright, so, we're going to finally move on to the thing I'm looking forward to the most, probably this year now, not include... You know, including all games. This is probably my most anticipated game for the rest of the year, even more so than Final Fantasy XV. Kingdom Hearts HD 2.8 Final Mix Chapter Prologue, which, you know, fucking dumb title, but fuck me, did that trailer look good. Wow. I, I was not, I, I honestly was not expecting it to look that good. I mean, I, I wasn't expecting to see that much footage from point two and uh um and the uh, um birth not birth by sleep but the the backlog for um x or whatever it's called uh yeah back cover at kingdom hearts chi back cover whatever the fuck it's called these fucking names jesus um so starts out with the trailer um it's the usual it's kingdom hearts 3d not much i can say about that other than you know it looks cool. It's it's Kingdom Hearts 3D, which is a great was a great game on the 3DS. I'm sure, it's going to be just as great of game, if not better, on the PS4. So I'm not going to dwell much on that. What I will dwell on though is Point Two Fragmentary Passage, which my God, are those graphics good? And thank God they kept the the Heartless Swarm from the very first Kingdom Hearts 3 trailer, like when you see T Sora running around in Twilight Town and that like swarm of Heartless comes after him. And it looks even cooler now in Fragmentary Passage. So this game is going to have Aqua trying to get access to some kind of, of clock tower and she has to go through uh, what I assume is Daybreak Town. It's like a, it's like a dark, it's like a swallowed version, a dark filled version of daybreak town so she has to go through that and i guess from the gameplay that we saw she has to find gears to fix the clock with and she also encounters tara apparently which is very interesting because right now tara is inside you know memory memory less xehanort at this at this period of time assumedly so um but there's a line in the trailer that says, you know, not even memories are safe from the darkness. So, this vision of Terra that she has could be a manipulation of the darkness, you know, like seeping into her head. It could be a situation where it's like the Shadow Realm from Yu-Gi-Oh, where you stay in the darkness so long that your mind just starts to break or something like that. But, I don't know, that could, that could be incorrect, given that when she sees Ansem in the realm of darkness at this the secret ending of birth by sleep she 
she seems to have her head on straight. She seems to have it together. Unless this is set after she meets Ansem in the Realm of Darkness, which is after Kingdom Hearts 2. Or this could have happened when Mickey and Riku were trapped in the Realm of Darkness and Riku had already escaped. So Mickey was still in there and Mickey could have encountered Aqua while he was in there. Or this could have happened... This could have happened when... Mickey went through the darkness to chase Organization 13 in Kingdom Hearts 2. I don't, I, I, we don't know when this takes place. And that will be a big deciding factor in what is going on with that Terra Vision. What's going on with the, the, the fragmented Daybreak Town in, in Point 2. There's a lot of questions from this trailer. And it seems to, it makes me, definitely makes me want to play it. Uh, I'm... I'm very excited to, to try out what Kingdom Hearts 3 is going to play like, and it looks just as flashy and, and awesome as it does in all the other Kingdom Hearts 3 trailers, especially with her final attack, which looks which looks so badass. And I love the agility that she has, the fact that she can like jump from super height, super high areas and like land and it's it just looks so cool. And the graphics, my goodness, the graphics, the art looks beautiful and i know i know they the reason kingdom hearts 3 took so long is they were like well we need to find a way to translate kingdom hearts into like these amazing graphics because we're technically they skipped a generation of consoles and i don't i don't count uh you know 0.5 and point uh 2.5 and 1.5 as like you know true ps4 titles they are remastered games but they weren't built for the ps4 um, so this was like a test for them to see what the Kingdom Hearts 3 graphics would look like with Fragmentary Passage. And it looks incredible. It, it looks better than I ever expected it to be. Even even with Unreal Engine 4, which I'm pretty sure this is Unreal Engine 4, it, it's done wonders for the look of the game, for the look of the series. And it feels next-gen, which is all I've ever wanted from, from Kingdom Hearts. So... And it makes me so excited for Kingdom Hearts 3. Now, moving on to the final bit of this trailer was the Kingdom Hearts Chi back cover, which is some new story. It's it's like the event... And I haven't really played much of Chi uh, to, you know, fully understand what's going on. I need to change that. Uh, so, this is... I, apparently, this is a story set during Chi, but it's it's concerning a different group of characters, which are the, the foretellers, which are like the masters of the, the different factions that are in Daybreak Down at the time. So, and it's like this, there's a, there's a traitor among them, apparently. Um, the, all the, fra the factions, it looks like war is brewing, and this, this could be the genesis of the Keyblade War. I, be I believe this is the genesis of the Keyblade War. Um, and there's a guy that's dressed in an Organization 13 coat, which is really weird. Um, I don't, I don't recognize that voice from the trailer. I mean, please let me know if you recognize that voice from, that, the, that's coming out of the, the Organization 13 coat, because I don't think I've ever heard of, I don't think I've ever heard that voice before. So, there's a lot to process, and I'm sorry I can't, I, I I don't know a lot of the characters' names from... I don't even know... like I, I haven't even memorized the names of the factions. So, from the gist of what I've got is that these guys are... You know, they have the... the They are... The, their factions have different sets of the Book of Prophecies. Which, the Book of Prophecies is an event... It is a book that predicted, you know, like the, the light will expire... And darkness will prevail, or something like that. Whatever. It, it, on this land shall darkness prevail and light expire. That's what it is. I remember. It's, it was what Xehanort said. So, that is a book that's going to tell the events of the future. But apparently, some event is going to change or something like that. Or the Book of Prophecy didn't predict something correctly. It's a little vague from the trailer. But the biggest thing I got out of it was it felt... It felt really epic for a Kingdom Hearts game where it's these these like large environments with large people 
Um, it, it feels like something very important to this story. And I know Kingdom Hearts gets a lot of shit for going like on these side stories and all that, and hell, I've, com I've complained about it in the past, but I feel like this one is actually very important, where I, I complained about Recoded not being important, which it's not, aside from if you really, really want to know every micro detail of how Mickey wrote that letter to Sora that he got at the end of Kingdom Hearts 2, um, it was useless, but the one thing they do mention in Recoded, especially the HD cutscenes, is the Book of Prophecies, which is like this little scene, and it's not worth going through the fucking three hours of cutscenes in 2.54. So, it, the Book of Prophecies is important, and this story seems to be, you know, like the story of the Foretellers, the story of how Daybreak Town actually got swallowed in darkness... And I think I recognize one of the characters from Chi that I've seen. I don't remember his name. It's the one that's like, hey, how about how about I talk about the book again? How about I tell you about the book? So there's just a lot to take in, and I was very happy with what I saw. And the most important thing to me is that it's getting a worldwide release date. And it's not it's not what they usually do where it's like Japan gets it six months before everybody else so spoilers are everywhere. It is, they're doing the Final Fantasy XV thing, which is a worldwide release date. December 2016 is when everybody is going to get it. So, thank you. Thank you, Square Enix. You finally have listened after all these years with that. Um, and an announce, of, of course, Kingdom Hearts 3 is going to have more information in the winter time. So, I'm going to, I can cross that off of what they're going to show during Sony's conference. We're going to get more Kingdom Hearts 3 info in winter. Um, probably in the form of a trailer, possible release date, blah blah blah. So yeah, um, that I find definitely find the most exciting out of all of them. Uh, I, and I'm hyped for this game. I cannot wait to get my hands on Fragmentary Passage. I'm not even going to play Dreamed Up Distance first. I'm going to skip that, go right into Fragmentary Passage, go right into Chi, uh, back back cover, and then I will play Dream Drop Distance. So, so yeah, those have it's been a very news filled past few days, and I'm I, I couldn't be happier about it. So yeah, all right. So thank you guys for watching. If you like what you see, subscribe. Let me know what you've thought of any of these trailers and announcements that I've, I've talked about in the video. So yeah, thank you guys for watching. Have a good one, guys. Take care.